I'm really excited about this first panel, which is called Path to Financial Success via Nonprofit-Owned Shelter Model. Um, I'm excited because the panelists will discuss the nonprofit-owned shelter and supportive housing co-location model, and you'll hear more about this. Site ownership combined with the availability of pre-acquisition funding made available through the city's partnership with Sea Change helped URI to expand into the supportive housing space for the very first time. And you'll soon see <clears throat> in the back here on the screens some examples of that. The expansion enables URI to support our families at every step along their healing journey. Uh, so the way this will work is um, we will ask each panel panelist to talk through um, uh, their um, experiences with uh, their particular part in this entire uh, transitional and uh, co-location and shelter co-location model. And then we will save time at the end for one or two questions. To the extent we are uh, running short of time, we're already just a tad bit behind, uh, we would encourage you to um, it, uh, approach some of the panelists or their team members uh, during the breaks uh, that we've designed intentionally for networking or at lunch. So um, we'll, we'll get more uh, information about that as we go. So we're all set, Napoleon? Yep. Okay. So I'm gonna introduce each panel, panelist, uh, and just raise your hand. Charlie Carroll, who is the Senior Vice President of Asset Management at U URI, Urban Resource Institute. Tina Alcedon, Al apologies, Tina. Deputy Commissioner, Capacity Planning and Development, New York City Department of Homeless Services. John McIntosh, Managing Partner, Sea Change Capital Partners. Uh, Christine Chisholm, Amitrain Group. Oliver Chase, Partner, Hershen Singer and Epstein. And Alan Hurwitz, Senior Vice President, LaRue Doyle and Associates. So question number one is uh, directed at Tina. Uh, Tina, can you share a little bit about the history of the nonprofit-owned shelter model and also talk about co-located shelter and supportive housing and why this is a good structure uh, for the city and for the nonprofit community? Sure, of course. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Great. First of all, what's more mortifying than your picture of it? I'm just really just so happy to be here, part of this uh, wonderful panel in this great space, uh, to really talk about NPO shelter development. As you heard uh, from Commissioner Park, and you'll also hear from Administrator Carter, shelter development for DHS is really just at the cornerstone of the work that we do, and it really bringing innovation and creativity to that development process is something that I feel very grateful to be a part of um, in government. And to be part of this exciting panel with all these fantastic strategic partners um, who've really come together to make these shelter projects come to fruition, it really does take all of these partners to make something like this happen. Um, and thank you to URI, of course, for all of your um, sharing of information and expertise in forums like this and others. It's really wonderful to have you as a leader in that uh, space as we continue to do development work with you. Um, I've worked in city government for over 20 years now, in DHS in particular, uh, during that whole time. And, you know, we've had um, all kinds of challenges as far as development has happened, but I definitely have seen the incredible work that it takes to continue to meet not only the shelter capacity demands, but also the service and care needs of New Yorkers experiencing homelessness. It's an ever evolving but never relenting demand that takes full partnership of government, nonprofits, for profits, developers, and lenders just to continue to grow that portfolio and stay ahead um, of that work. Um, and for many years, the only way to create public shelters was for a not for profit to have a nine year contract with a for profit landlord. And that really forced us to be in their pocket, right? And really needed to depend on them to create capacity for us. And really what we were coming to learn is we needed short, midterm, and long-term solutions. We need more tools in our toolbox to continue to meet the demand and continue to make sure that our mission-driven purpose was the, at the forefront of what we do. Um, in 2017, a change in policy made it possible for nonprofits to secure 30-year contracts. And this enabled nonprofits to finance um, high-quality, purpose-built shelters, which we really <laughs> rebranded to nonprofit-owned shelters. Um, and most importantly, you know, uh, the nonprofit ownership, of course, and the shelter model was born from that idea. Uh, this model does this at a lower cost over the long term and secures the long term use of these shelters far beyond a nine year contract 
and secures our portfolio for decades to come. Um, but most importantly, and what I'm most proud of, is that the nonprofit owned model has really opened up the potential for innovation. Innovation in design, innovation in ADA compliance and accessibility, programming, and the opportunity for co location of housing, both affordable and supportive. Um, other you know, very special community facing benefits. These are shelters that I like to say, these are shelters that are built to be seen. And I think that that is really different. Um, I think there was a time when we wanted shelters just fade into the community and look like everywhere else. And we really turned the corner here um, and really wanted to sort of take a step into the design world and make sure we were building spaces where services could be provided, as we have always done at a very high level. But these are beautiful, beautiful buildings. And then we feel very proud um, to be able to offer to the, to the clients that we serve. Um, to date, to show our commitment to this model, we actually have 43 NPO um, pipeline and existing sites in our portfolio with all the populations that DHS serves represented in that number. Um, and with a total of 2,697 units of housing attached through our partnerships with HDC and HPD, um, it's super remarkable. And we're very, very excited about that. And that partnership also, um, you know, came into play when we were developing the Shelter Acquisition Loan Fund, which Sean will speak about as well. So if you are interested in becoming a provider of this model and learning more about it, please definitely come to speak to me. Um, I'm here as well as my colleague, Michelle Sledge. She does a lot of our front end work and um, you should definitely get to her. She's wonderful. Um, and our term sheet for the NPO model and the loan fund are actually available on the DHS website on our development tab. So I encourage everybody to take a look at it, learn more about it. And come speak to me if you have any questions. Thank you, Tina. Uh, next up, John McIntosh. John, Sea Change's support has been invaluable to URI throughout the pre-development phase. Can you share a little bit with us about how it works with a particular focus on the partnerships that make this work possible? Uh, absolutely. Um, so we launched the, the nonprofit that I'm referring to, uh, Sea Change launched the, the um, New York Shelter Acquisition Redevelopment Fund about 18 months ago with one simple purpose, to help nonprofits develop, own, and operate really high quality shelters. And as 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 Molly said, you know, it's it's not often that you get to be involved in something that you think is not one, not two, but three wins. Thought that those shelters would be um, good for the people experiencing homelessness who would be able to, to be there. Um, good for the not -for profits that were managing and owning them. Um, but also quite frankly good tax thing because I think if you if you do the math um, at least for the, the, the longer term shelters, the cost of an appropriately financed nonprofit owned shelter is simply lower than, um, than leasing a property short term from the, from the market. So we're really excited. You asked about partnerships. I'm a little bit sheepish um, being here because there's been a lot of sea change, sea change. This, <laughs> this fund is itself a partnership between um, a couple of committed philanthropists uh, uh, Jonathan and, and Jennifer Soros, um, Mark Reed, who was here, maybe just gone, um, the Clark Foundation, the New York Community Trust, but they, they put up the money that allows us to make below market flexible loans. Um, it's partnership with not just DHS and HDC, but also individual people at DHS. Um, you know, Molly Tina, Brian Shea, uh, Jessica Katz, um, and also some other folks like Ted Houghton, who were uh, an inspiration um, and a source of advice and cajoling over the five years it took to get the fundraise. Um, so it's you know behind behind that mouthful of the New York City Acquisition Redevelopment Fund really is a partnership and it involves people. Um, but the most important partner for the fund are are the URIs of, of the world who who are committed who are committed to to building owning and operating high quality shelters and who are in active discussions or negotiations with DHS and for whom um, funding, financing the acquisition pre-development costs, pre-registration are the gating factor. Um, so I, you know, I would encourage, as, as Tina said, I would encourage you if, if, if this is a model that you're interested in pursuing, whether you have a ton of experience, whether you have no experience at all, 
um, whether you're somewhere in the middle, uh, wherever you are in the process, you know, please, please do reach out. Um, we raised this fund to help you um, to get this done, um, to create this win win win. Um, and that, you know, and that usually starts with phone call. It's been a, it's been a privilege to, to partner with, with Matt and Charlie um, and do our IT team. Um, and I hope to do some other things, you know, over the coming years um, to create this win win win. Great. Thanks, John. Uh, Charlie. Uh, URI was the first nonprofit to receive a loan from the Shelter Acquisition Fund, and it is still the only nonprofit to have done so. Can you share a little bit about the process and what other nonprofits should know? Sure. Uh, good morning, everybody. I would say that first thing I would do is, if you were thinking about it, after you read the term sheet and the different things, call sea change. Call John and talk about the project. We called. We had a project that we wanted to do, and, and we were lacking acquisition funds and pre-development funds. And the reason that project is going forward and we're discussing today, which will be a shelter for a family of children, as well as affordable housing on the lot, is based on the acquisition fund and being able to talk to Joe and say, this is what we're trying to accomplish. Do you feel like the fund could work? And being able to have those conversations in the beginning and really brainstorming and, and working collaboratively provided us the opportunity to then file the application and go through the process to get it. So if you have that, that project that you're like, you don't know if we can do it, you know, we're, we're short $3 million for a down payment, which we were, that's what, what made it happen for us. And so the city shelter acquisition fund and sea change were invaluable. Um, John and his team are, and DHS are mission driven. They want us to do these. So to be able to talk about it and be able to go through our process, it became, it, it made the application process easier. I think one of the big things too, as a non-for-profit, the way the fund is set up, the recourse, if it, something didn't go through, is 25% of the loan to the non-for-profit. The city is taking on that other 75%. So when you have a, a thoughtful board that takes their fiduciary responsibility very seriously, this was a very appealing thing because as an organization, we were only, and we, we moved forward, so we're in a really good place, but we were, at that moment, had that 25%. So we were able to take the full 3.75 million and then keep 750,000 to have pre-development work that needed to be done. The environmentals, our great architects at Offgang to get them started, to get the group going and moving forward. And without that, it's very tough for a not-for-profit to do that. So we would really encourage everybody pick up the phone and give them a call. Even if it feels like it's a really complicated process or deal, still go to them and have that conversation because they will be your partner. And then on the second part for us is our partners that are on the stage with us, Amitri and Groove, Hershen Singer and Epstein, Guru and Doyle. DHS really work with a team of people that do this work and be able to work collaboratively. Um, you don't need a huge internal infrastructure to do this work, but you do need the right work. Thanks. Thanks, Charlie. Christine, these projects can seem daunting, as Charlie is just referring to. Can you share a little bit about how you and your colleagues at Amitrine support nonprofits through the process? And can you also talk a little bit about the different ways that these deals can be structured? Sure. So um, this particular project that we're talking about, 130th Street, um, it was a big lot. It was expensive. Um, you know, we wanted to do two projects on this lot, and we had to figure out how do you make that happen? How do you how do you put that together? And this lot was a lot. Um, and so um, put it. So we were saying we're going to take shelter and we're going to do housing, and we have to do. Uh, we couldn't do them at the same time. We knew that it wasn't going to happen. And so we wound up um, splitting the lot and buying them in two separate um, transactions. So it's all the pieces of kind of trying to figure out and start with what we're trying to accomplish and where is the risk and how do we reduce that risk. Um, and so, as uh, Charlie mentioned, by going to sea change and getting the acquisition loan loan, we were able to reduce some of the acquisition risk. Um, another great thing that came about um, as a result of borrowing from the sea change through the acquisition plan 
was that we were also able to use that money to support buying the whole site uh, because we put down a down payment on the whole site. So it, it gave us a head start on getting the, um, the housing going too. And we've, we've done that a lot of times in reverse where we've gone to CSH or others and said, well, if you want to get this housing, we're going to need you to lend us some money to get the shelter going as well. Um, in this case, it was the uh, shelter acquisition funds that allowed us to be able to buy the site um, and we'll be able to do the housing on that site as well. Um, and so I may mean, like this model. I think um, a lot of people talk about particularly Molly about the nonprofits owning their shelters. Um, I uh, worked for VRC for 15 years as their as their CFO. Um, I'm well aware of you know what the shelters can do, what they should do. Um, when I first started at, at um, BRC, we had a project back in 2001. We had a project on Bowery, which was an old flop house. Um, and you know what? Some of you not even know what flop house is so long ago, but uh, they were kind of like particle board dividers with chicken wire around the top and little flimsy doors. And people lived there. Um, they paid a nightly rate. And uh, BRC had taken over the building and was going to redevelop it. And we had some into a shelter and, to, and supported housing. We had some people who just wouldn't leave and they stayed there all through the construction and they wound up being the first residents in supported housing upstairs. And um, they went from living in really tough conditions to, to nice SRO units. Um, and soon after we opened, somebody came and said, oh, I have a complaint. And we were kind of like, how could you possibly have a complaint? He says, I really think that we should have massage heads on these shower heads. Why don't we have that? And so when you imprint somebody's surroundings, their expectations really improve. Their expectations grew as well. And that person um, was an elderly man who had been homeless for a long time. And he had a twin sister who he hadn't seen in 50 years. And he wound up getting sober, um, getting s some help, and he wound up reconnecting with his sister. And I always think that a lot of that had to do with he, his surroundings improved. And so I think when we look at what we're doing for, for the clients, that that's such an important thing. And when the nonprofits own their buildings, they get to to control what that, what the surroundings are. Mm -hmm. um, and we've done a lot of, a lot of great work with you and I and with others to, to develop that and to know what, what the clients need. And um, we primarily at Amtrain, we work with mostly with nonprofits and we want to build strong nonprofits. And we do have people who come to us and they say, oh, well, you know, this is for a shelter. They don't really need any amenities or this is like, and like, you are not our people. You know, we, we are not, that's not, it's not the, what we want to do. And so we do work primarily with nonprofits and we help them figure out how do you manage a big project like this. And uh, we take on um, at Amatree what the pieces that um, that the nonprofit can do on their own and, uh, and try to be um, a little more smooth for them. Uh, we work a lot with DHS, um, with HPD, um, with other funding sources um, to try to. Uh, make all pieces work and put together. Um, and uh, we've worked a lot with, with Alex um, in, in financing these. And one of the great things that it's, I think is sometimes over, is uh, missed about the nonprofit owned shelters, particularly the family shelters, is that they're being financed by private institutions, a lot of um, insurance companies and pension funds, and we're building housing. And because these shelters are, are housing there, full housing units. And so we just in, in, in our small company, we have done, um, we're getting close to a billion dollars of investment from private sources into housing units. And I think that that launched Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, okay. And thank you, Christine. Um, Oliver, Hirsch and Singer represents you or I in the majority of our real estate uh, transactions. Can you explain the role your firm plays in negotiating with lenders, the city, and other nonprofit boards, or and nonprofit boards, and perhaps expand a bit about how your work changed based on the way the deal is structured? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first, I want to I do want to say thank you, you or I, for putting this together, and and especially I think the timing is is really nice for an event like this because, as we all know, it's a bit of a grim national picture right now, but. It, it's great to be in a room with people who 
are pushing in the same direction. We care about the same thing. And, you know, we're going to keep doing our work. Right. And, and I think, you know, we have a, we have a big challenge, which is that homelessness here in New York. And, you know, we got to keep, keep pushing. So when we think about our role on the heels, um, I think it's useful to look at sort of three uh, areas of emphasis or, or buckets of work. Uh, the first, and some of which I, I do, I overlap a lot with Christine and some with Alex. Um, but so the, the, the first one would be strategic planning and structuring. The second would be market advising. And the third is really the core legal scope. And um, let me just talk briefly about, about each of those. Um, so the strategic planning and structuring piece is really sort of the upfront work that we do and, and really an ongoing conversation with nonprofit profit leadership and oftentimes the board as well. Um, to make sure that we understand what their goals are in, in getting into the nonprofit uh, shelter model, uh, to understand what their risk tolerance is, what their internal capacity is, uh, you know, in other internal constraints, uh, general real estate development experience, and also to make sure that the board and the executive team understands uh, what the risks and opportunities are in this model, right? So we use that sort of conversation to help uh, guide the structure, right? That, that we think is most appropriate for the nonprofit client. So, and, and that, could, that could be a number of things like within the nonprofit owned shelter model, there's a, there's a number of different executions, right? There could be a nonprofit that's gonna do the whole development themselves uh, from beginning to end with a, the, with a team. Uh, there's also, you know, co-development models where you could have a, a, a for-profit or non-profit developer partner that takes uh, the lead and maybe a site acquisition or, a, or a, um, in the development side. And then there's also, you know, maybe acquiring a to-be-constructed or a constructed building to use as a shelter. So there's a number of different ways uh, that you can sort of manage risk, uh, and, 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 and look to, to enhance the, the opportunities and, and mitigate the risks of the, of the nonprofit in, in, a, in a particular transaction. And so that's sort of the strategic and, and structuring piece. Now, it's also worth noting that a lot of times you're, you're not going to be able to, you know, you're, you're not going to necessarily dictate what the structure is, right? Because sometimes somebody might come to you with an opportunity, right? Say, you know, we have a piece of land. Do you want to do a co-development deal with us, or do you want? To, we're going to build a shelter. You want to buy it from us once it's built, and in that case, you know, it's a similar, it's a similar discussion. You know, is this is this opportunity well suited to the nonprofit strengths, uh, to their to their to their uh, sensitivities, and if so, you know, how do we tweak the structure to to best uh, to best protect the nonprofit and and to to sort of expand the opportunities there. So that's that piece. The second piece is the market advising, which is really sort of not a separate scope of work, but it's, it informs everything that we do. And this is a lot of what Kirsten does as well. Um, you know, we've done we've done a lot of these deals at this point. I think maybe the majority of them uh, we've been a part of. And so through that through that process, we learned a lot about you know, uh, and with Alex as well. What, you know, best in market financing terms. Uh, you know, if you're doing a co-development deal, what, what are the things to push on with your development partner in terms of sharing development, sharing risk, um, you know, or with your GC, you know, who, and maybe the most valuable intelligence is who are the good players, right? Because if you're new to this space, um, you, you might not know, but, you know, up on the stage, you have people who are not new to this space and who have done this a lot of time. And I think that that really at the front end is some of the most valuable information that you can have is who who are competent, trustworthy partners that you can you that you can deal with and know that your project is going to get done. And that doesn't mean it, you know, real estate development is a challenge, right? There's unknowns, there's unforeseen conditions, but you, you shouldn't you shouldn't be wondering about is your partner going to screw you or not. <laughs> <laughs> So that's that piece. And then the final, the final piece is, is the, what I call the core legal scope, which is sort of what you think of probably more when you're hired the lawyer. You know, we're, we're a full service transactional real estate firm. So we have a zoning group that can help with 
feasibility and zoning question up front. We handle the purchase and sales, the acquisition, financing, uh, the development, the team contracts, and GC architect. Um, you know, if there is a co-development deal or a JV or uh, that sort of thing, handling those negotiations. And then, of course, the PHS specific scope. Uh, which fortunately at this point is pretty well based, right? Like we, a lot of us on the stage spent a lot of time when this model was first rolled out, working with DHS legal, city law, uh, lending community to get the DHS contract into a financeable form. Uh, that, was a, that was a lot of, of blood, sweat and tears. Uh, but fortunately that work is largely done. So, so you know, at this point, the DHS contract really is a, is a well, date uh, work and, and really the only tweaks that sometimes are needed are to make sure your structure is sort of appropriately contemplated and not in that. Field. So I think that's that's sort of the big picture of yeah. how we slot into Great. the field. Thank you, Oliver. And then Alex, uh, you are a replacement agent at LaRue Doyle and specialize in project financing. After nonprofits overcome the pre-development financing challenges, they can come to you for project financing. Can you share a little bit about the serendipitous manner in which this uh, model was born? And for nonprofits who are interested in doing this work, can you talk about how you can get this done, even if you don't have a large internal infrastructure? Absolutely. Um, I definitely come to this world from a different angle. Um, I used to work for the affordable housing, now for the housing companies in the city. I now work for a very small firm that was uh, founded by two partners who worked in the private capital and the insurance company. Um, and starting when I first started in 2012, I was always trying to find innovative ways to sort of blend the two and how can we get this private capital into doing public good work, sort of affordable housing primarily which is not really a world that they typically bump into. Um, ended up doing a deal in uh, Long Island City was an affordable housing project that replaced the nicer's loan with the insurance company loan, which is unusual. Um, I thought, okay, I'm starting to get some traction here. Um, you know, I'll try and make this brief. But I, the next loan that sort of fits into this picture I did was an affordable housing project and a shelter in you know, Crown Heights. Um, and so I was working with this developer. We got this thing done. It was very difficult, very out of the box. Um, but at the same time, this developer was working with DHS on a 30 year contract for a shelter in the Bronx. Um, and when I asked to see this contract to really dig in, what does this look like? And who's on the hook for what? How does this work? For the nonprofit owner of the city's paying money, et cetera. Um, I really went off when I read this contract. And I thought, this is not only financeable, I think. I think this could fit a program, but it finances 100% of the cost. Um, the city's really standing behind us, and they're really standing. This is ultimately our responsibility to our projects. Um, I got this deal quoted. I went to everyone I could think of. Most people looked at me from outside, trying to finance a long homeless shelter, and I'm talking to people in the Midwest. I think I'm crazy. Um, but I got it quoted. I got to sit down with one firm, and they said, look, I think this makes a lot of sense. It's definitely strange. But excuses are there. So I got reported. Unfortunately, the deal died. It became a very political deal in the Bronx at the time. They didn't want any more shelters, didn't want any more affordable housing. So the deal ended up just not going forward. Um, but shortly after that, Christine gave me a call about something even more unusual <laughs> um, and said, I heard you did something interesting when I leave home on Allen City. I've got an animal shelter I want to finance. Ground up construction, and there's a dirty piece of land. Really, sort of. Out of the blue, with this, there's no map for this. There's, there's the only thing. There's no program. There's no value call when you want to find it. No. And I said, look, you know, you might think I'm crazy. I think I can definitely get this done. I just spoke to someone about something similar. Um, this was with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, not DHS. Uh, worked with Oliver as well. We, well, blood, sweat, and tears to get this thing over the finish line. Um, but as soon as I got that done, I went and sat in Brian Shea and uh, Michelle Slade. And basically said, look, I've got this model. You can't see it can't be done. I just think it's I think this is where we should go. This this we have not played for in the market. Um, it is a lot of education for everybody. Um, but it's the best for the city, it's the best for the nonprofits, it's hundred percent financing, it's going on until it liquidates in thirty years or thirty years plus considering the construction involved. Um, and the first deal we got done was with URI in Brooklyn. 
uh, and that really sort of sparked it and set it up, and we had a road map. There were some bumps with COVID, you know, slow down. Mm -hmm. um, but I've done 17 shelters at this point, it's paying out of million dollars in financing. And, um, that's not to say that these are easy, they are not. And I think it's been said several times, and it's absolutely true, it depends on the team you have involved to get these things on the finish line. There are a lot of nuances. It's not cookie cutter as much as I would like it to be. Um, but obviously, it's doable, and I think it still is the best way to go for the city, for the residents, for the nonprofits that have to operate these things. It's just the best model out there. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we have time for maybe two questions from the audience. Um, and uh, Will will come to you with a microphone. So anyone, uh, any questions, just raise your hand. Will, come over here. Just keep your hand raised. How are you? Good. First, I want to say thank you to everyone on the panel because the work you guys are doing is incredible. Um, I had a question about infusing resident management, resident management corporation, resident councils, that's the position share for anything on that? The two shared ownership of the shelter is actually going towards some of the residents in the shelter. Any ideas on that, guys? Do you mean like a like a like a color model or kind of kind of? But where our ownership is actually uh, shared between uh, the residents. Um, is, is there any appetite for that? Is there any way that that could somehow? Because on the ground, that would really be wonderful as a strategy for getting people to recognize this as something that's, you know, beneficial to them personally. So I'm just wondering, is it possible or at all, is there some sort of uh, pathway for uh, resident councils who are looking to, for instance, purchase a building and purchase a shelter and move forward? Uh, what are some of the strategies you guys have outlined? And that, certainly Oliver, but I don't know if the city has any experience with that kind of ownership. Uh, we don't, but thank you for that question. And I love the innovative spirit behind it. Um, I, I would say that, you know, uh, traditionally we think of DHS shelter systems as a stop towards permanency, right? So to the extent that that would be something you would consider more on the housing realm of a fully needed shelter and housing model, I think would make sense. I don't know if others feel differently about that from a housing perspective, but I don't know if that necessarily conforms to a shelter perspective, because we really want clients to move on, meet them where they're at, of course, provide services so that they can become independent and ready for hmm. their next step towards permanency. But I love the, again, the innovation and the, and the thinking behind it. Okay. Anyone else? We have time for one more. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, 